because we will have time for questions, pay attention to what you want to know more about. We'll discuss and share a little bit more afterwards. So Julia and Steve can take it away from here. Great. Okay, Thanks, so Sarah. I, I'm recording. I think I've got just about everybody on mute. Um, so at the end, we'll unmute everyone. So remember your questions. And Steve, it is all yours. Well, thank you. Um, the the top, Sarah asked me to talk about really a topic of my choice. I, I'm a, a retired arts teacher. Uh, I taught visual art for the last part of my career. And uh, then since retirement six years ago, I'm a producing artist. And one of the topics that I love to deal with, and I like to talk about it, is the world of color. Um, and so today I'm going to give you a little uh, a shallow dive into the world of color in a number of different ways. Um, I hear people tell me often, uh, in fact, a couple of you have told me that uh, color is challenging in various hobbies that you, that you do. I think um, the, one of the reasons that I think everybody can relate to this topic is that color is very personal and in many ways very passionate in a lot of people. Every single one of you could tell me a color that you love and a color that you detest. And you spend great deals of time, I'm sure, uh, thinking about exactly what shade of green goes on the dining room wall, what shade uh, that you think you makes you look great, and think uh, colors that you think make you look terrible and sick, sickly. And so there's all these kind of emotional connections. There are colors that our culture has uh, labeled in certain ways, color terms enter into our language. Are you a red state or a blue state? Are, are you a blue blood? Are you green with envy? Um, and, and they all have, all, all these colors are, are very charged in, in our lives. So I'm gonna talk about color in a number of different ways. We're gonna explore how artists use color and kind of the mechanics of color, which I think is very enlightening if you, if you are one of these that are challenged. And then maybe these will, uh, this explanation will give you some language to talk about perhaps why you prefer certain colors or combinations of colors over others. We're gonna talk about the world of color schemes, which is kind of a mystery, but we're gonna unpack that a little bit. I'm gonna talk about how the church tells time with color. And we're gonna talk about the various seasons and vestments and, and uh, fabrics that you see on the altar helping us uh, determine what season it is and why those colors uh, reflect those seasons. Um, I'm gonna introduce you to a very strange and interesting corporation that studies how our culture looks at color and tries to predict things like color trends in fashion and home decor, really an interesting uh, company. And then we're gonna talk about how various cultures um, consider the symbolism of color, sometimes very different than our own culture does. So with that, I'm going to ask Julia to put up the first slide. And, um, and I'm, going to, I'm going to show you four slides. And I'm going to ask you to note how you uh, react to these four slides in sequence. So here's number one. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And so without having a, a group discussion, um, I'll bet that you even had some physical reactions. I'll bet, I'll bet you grinned, perhaps. Uh, you had some emotional reactions here, not only the longing of not being in church on Christmas, but, but certainly the impact of those brilliant, that brilliant red carpet and all the colors of Christmas, which we experienced in such different ways this year. So it, that just kind of reinforces what I, what I uh, mentioned before that color. Um, I've, I've always thought to myself and I preach this to my students that 
color is really the most powerful tool that an artist has in their back pocket. Some might disagree with that, but I really think it's color. Um, and we work a lot in, I, I taught so many different areas of art, photography, graphic design, junior high art, uh, portfolio development. And those were all very different kinds of topics. But one of the things that went through all classes is, is the power of color and the impact of color or the absence of color and, and how those uh, two ideas are always uh, one of the tools that an artist uses. Um, next slide, please. So when you study art, and perhaps in every art room in the world, there is a depiction of the color wheel. And uh, we use the color wheel to kind of explain how color works and to understand how colors are mixed, how colors are produced, and then ultimately to uh, guide us when we select colors that work together or work against each other and that sort of thing. So you can think about the color wheel as a rainbow, uh, you know, a strip of a rainbow that's kind of curved around to meet itself on the end. And then you can see this kind of natural progression of color that, that happens as we consider uh, the, the rainbow or all the, the tones that are available to us. Next slide. The primary colors, and of course, this is reviewing maybe from elementary school art class, but the primary colors, red, blue, and yellow, um, we say, and this is with a little bit of a wink, but we say that those are primary because they can't be mixed from any other colors. Um, red has to be uh, obtained through pigments, uh, blue and yellow as well. You can't mix two colors together to get red and blue and yellow. So we find those are the, the sort of the basis of the, the color world. Next slide. Then we think about secondary colors and you can see the grayed out triangle from the first slide. Those are the primaries. The secondaries happen right in between each primary and um, to understand the color wheel even better, you would get a, a bunch of pots of color, maybe just three to begin with, maybe just red, blue, and yellow, and figure out how they mix together to produce all the other colors. So purple is halfway between red and blue, and theoretically, if you mix red and blue together in equal quantities, you get purple, likewise green and orange. And then in between those, you can see, for example, between red and purple is a red violet, and those are called intermediate colors or uh, tertiary colors. And then it just goes on and on. I mean, it goes on and on in that the human eye uh, can recognize up to 10 million different colors. So if you are a little bamboozled when you walk into Lowe's to try to pick a color for the dining room, you know, I, you know, everybody gets that because of all the, the variations that, that there are. Next slide, please. Oh, that is not the row oh, that turned black and white for some reason. Oh, okay. I can, I can, yeah, let's go. Uh, um, Julia, back to the black and white slide. This was in color in the, in the original presentation, but I can sort of, we can sort of bypass this. I wanted to talk a little bit about the three properties of color. And uh, it's, it's important to know these so you have names for the things that, that, that you're dealing with in the world of color, hue, saturation, and value. And now I think it's important to go on to see what I'm talking about in, in actual color. So next slide. Hue has to do with the color name. So any color, any color um, is, a named color. So our dining room wall is green to begin with. It's not emerald green. It's different than that, but it's green. Hue is really easy to understand. Is it green? Is it yellow? Is it a kind of blue? Next slide, please. Saturation has to do with the brightness or dullness of a color. So here we have um, what you might see on a color strip at Lowe's. So we have a bright, brilliant, pure magenta, and then it gets duller and duller 
Now let's go on to the next slide because it gets a little confusing when you actually do go to Lowe's. Value is the third category or the third um, uh, property of color. And value equals light and dark. Now, initially, it looks a lot like bright and dull, but it's really a whole different world. Light and dark has to do with a color where you add white or you add black. And it's just subtly different than a, 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 a saturation, which is bright to dull. And it is kind of one of the most, the more confusing aspects of learning about color when something is light and dark and when something is bright and dull. Julie, if we can just go backwards, the way that you dull a color is to add its opposite. And we'll, we'll refer back to that in a, in a little bit. So uh, bright and dull adds an opposite color to dull it down. Next slide. Light and dark adds black or white. So once again, I'll say that you know to understand this fully, um, it, it's it requires paint mixing, and then you sort of get that you know what all these various um, variations are. Next slide. So then the color wheel starts getting complex, and in fact, this if you can see this, th this only adds light and dark to the basic color wheel. So to add brightness and dullness, to add saturation, you'd almost have to have kind of a three-dimensional kind of model of where color goes. So it's, it's really a complicated world and um, you know, it, takes, it takes time and experience and vocabulary to kind of understand it well. So let, let's talk about color schemes. Color schemes, um, are not just reaching into a pile of colored pencils and grabbing something and working with it. Color schemes are intentional combinations of color. And uh, one of the greatest challenges I had as a teacher, um, especially with younger students, was to break away, and I'll just give this out as a, you know, something to really think about, break away from what are your favorite colors to accept and embrace what colors are most effective in whatever situation you're trying to figure out, whether it's your midlife crisis car color or, or your wardrobe or the colors that you live with, um, what, what are the most effective kinds of colors and, and how, how do we um, figure that out? Next slide, please. So a very easy kind of color scheme to understand and work with is an analogous color scheme. And there are do dozens of color schemes that have names. We're only gonna talk about two of them today, but you know there are lots of online resources to sort of figure this out. Anne Morris gave me a book from her volunteer experience, which has hundreds of pages of, kind of named color schemes. And it's a really fascinating Book. So when I'm, you know, dealing with green, but I'm kind of sick of what I've done with green, I can page through that book and see what happens when, when orange goes with green or when red goes with green. Anyway, back to analogous color schemes. These arcs here, these red arcs that you see, these are just to sort of separate out an analogous group of colors. And, and it's a very simple idea. Colors that are next to each other on the color wheel always ensure that you will get a kind of a harmonious color scheme. Uh, so this group of red, purple, um, uh, violet um, it is always gonna sort of hang together. It's safe. Uh, there's no adventure uh, in an analogous color scheme. And that's good, I, I mean that as a good thing. Or this group of cooler colors, this blue, turquoise, green, lime, that's a very, uh, you know, easy uh, color scheme to work with. Again, it's safe. Uh, it's gonna, it's gonna always look good together. Next slide. Here in in decor, here are some analogous color schemes. So it's not just one color. It's not just purple and light purple and dark purple. It goes a little bit broader than that on the color wheel, and you know, like I said, adds harmony. Next, next slide. And then kind of the opposite idea 
would be to jump across the color wheel. So complementary colors are opposite colors. So yellow to purple is a complementary color scheme. And that always provides the most contrast where analogous is harmonious, complementary is a little more adventurous and provides contrast and you know, big personality, maybe even surprise. Um, and interestingly, graphic designers often use complementary color schemes for things like business identification and logos. Next slide, please. Here are just a few uh, complementary color schemes that I found about logos that we all know and, and recognize. And if you go through them, they're almost all about opposites. So the Miami Dolphins, turquoise to that golden yellow is an opposite. FedEx is an opposite. Tide is a little bit different in that it's a triadic color scheme. So these three colors are kind of equidistant on the color wheel. And, um, and what the designers here are, are trying to do, they're trying to make a bold statement that you can remember easily and identify easily uh, because they are bold contrasting um, ideas. Next slide. So the church uh, uses color to kind of tell time. Uh, the, each season has uh, colors, and thank you to Kager Hardinger, who is hidden behind, well, partially hidden behind some of these vestments, and uh, she helped me uh, get these out and photograph these this past week. Um, Advent uh, in our church is the blue vestment. Um, Advent is the blue, and I'm just going to read some, some things here from uh, a source that I found. Blue for the hope of healing that Christ brings uh, during the Advent season. In some churches, Advent is purple, purple for penitence. Um, I did also discover that back in church history, Advent uh, often was black. That sounds a little severe, but, but what happened then was the black dyes uh, way back in history were very unstable and they would fade to blue and purple. So that might be one of the reasons that uh, Advent now is blue and purple. Christmas and other festivals are white and often gold uh, for celebration and purity. Green, and uh, green is kind of a new uh, vestment and um, altar uh, fabrics for our church, but green is for life and growth. Um, in Epiphany and uh, part, of, part of Pentecost season as well. Um, in Lent, we go back to, again to purple for penitence. Uh, in some churches, linen is also used in Lent and, and Advent. And linen, I, I guess, would be like the absence of color to sort of take away the, the, uh, the joy and the brilliance of, of color during those penitential seasons. It's a time of prayer, fasting, and also growth and study and, and preparation for Easter. Um, a Holy Week begins on Palm Sunday and red uh, is the color of the story of the passion. Uh, and then back to Easter for the color of joy and celebration. Pentecost again, red for the day of Pentecost and green for the season of Pentecost to remind us of the growth of the church. Um, Next, next slide. So our church until recently evidently, and uh, I'm sure there are people who are watching that could correct the detail of what I'm gonna say, but uh, St. Michael's didn't have a green vestment or, or it, it hadn't been replaced in a long time. So uh, the uh, Altar Guild kind of in partnership with the aesthetics committee uh, went about uh, creating a green frontal for the altar and a green vestment. And the color might be a little surprising that it is not, you know, emerald green, Irish green. It is this soft um, green. Now, let me tell you, color theory-wise, it's a yellowish green. That's the hue. It's been dulled a little bit. So it's not brilliant lime green, but it's been dulled by probably the addition of a tiny little bit of red, which is the opposite color or, or Magenta actually would be opposite the lime green, dulled down a little bit, and then 
a little bit of white added also to make it uh, a softer hue. Now the color, and this is you know always what we're what, what a lot of interior designers are looking for. They're looking to sort of make some kind of dialogue uh, between things that already exist and things that might be added uh, newly. So this needlepoint frontal that is added to a lot of um, of the frontal arrangements of the altar. Uh, next slide, please, Julia. Uh, it is, of course, you know, I, I was at St. Michael's a long time before I ever knew this, but this is an exact replication of the stained glass window that's right to the uh, left of the altar as you look at the altar, the one that uh, looks out or, or um, is, is in the hallway down to the fellowship hall. And so this was created, you know, to uh, refer to that. And now if you look at the needlepoint just to the left of this, you can see those two green colors that uh, are used to match the frontal. And Julie, if you can just go back one again. So the two greens of the fabric frontal, the altarpiece, are, are taken right, right from that. Um, I also remember that we had, when I was on the aesthetics committee uh, a few years ago, and we were uh, thinking we were repainting the fellowship hall, and one of our goals was to bring in the outdoors into the colors of the the new fellowship hall decor. So you see greens in the carpet because those windows there out onto the woods are so. It's, it's one of the most beautiful features of that room. And so we brought in those sort of natural green tones uh, to make that all happen. And that's how, that's how uh, designers work. And I think it's kind of an interesting uh, way of looking at things. Next slide. And the next slide. Okay, let me talk, th this is really jumping now to a new topic. Um, you may have heard of the Pantone Corporation. Pantone originally was a color matching system. So even though these look like you, what, what you might find again at Lowe's uh, when you're painting your walls, these, these are, a, this is a whole different world of color. And if you'd see one of these uh, swatches up close, there is a very specific long series of, of numbers and it's a system that graphic designers and printers and people who make fabrics and uh, all kinds of, of things in the world of design use to match colors. So for example, you all know that sometimes colors on your phone will look very different than a color on your computer screen. Uh, various colors will look different in photographs. Um, you know, even two cameras taking the same picture will look very different. And this is a, a system of coded uh, colors that uh, designers use to say, I don't want just any yellow when you print this piece. I want Pantone 340. And when you submit that color to the printer, uh, you will ensure that your color gets matched accurately. Um, and it's a very, very complicated system for all, all kinds of, uh, of areas of design and, and art. Um, and interestingly, the Pantone organization studies color that are colors that are popular or trendy, uh, but they also, uh, they also investigate our culture and where our politics and um, all kinds of things are, and they come up with predictions. Next slide, Julia. So here are the Pantone colors of the year 2021. And let me just read to you the explanation of, of why the Pantone uh, chose these two colors. Usually it's one color this year, they've chosen two. And by the way, they use these colors and, and designers use these colors to predict fashion trends. You might start seeing this color on racks in stores. Wait, does anybody go to a store anymore? I don't think so. But you might see these online and uh, in, in decor. Next slide. So here are some sort of trending ideas that you might start seeing. 
Julia back one slide. And here's what Pantone says about these colors. As people look for ways to fortify themselves with energy, clarity, and hope to overcome the continuing uncertainty, spirited and emboldening shades satisfy our quest for vitality. Pantone 13-0647, which is the uh, yellow, it, it's called illuminating, is a bright and cheerful yellow sparkling with vivacity and a warming yellow shade imbued with solar power. And Pantone Ultimate Gray 17-5104 is emblematic of solid and dependable elements which are everlasting and provide a firm foundation. The colors of pebbles on the beach and natural elements whose weathered appearance highlights an ability to stand the test of time. Ultimate Gray quietly assures, encouraging feelings of composure, steadiness, and resilience. So I think that's kind of interesting and you might wanna sort of dig into the Pantone website. Um, it's also really interesting to go back and look at the colors of the year in history and to see where the world was, for example, with environmental issues, with politics, with uh, you know the crazy 80s, the rebellious 70s, and uh, the Pantone colors of the year kind of describe those eras in you know through color. So let's move on now, and I'm gonna we're gonna talk. Uh, uh, let's see, Julia, a slide, and then one more. Yeah, I'm gonna talk to you about uh, you know how various cultures uh, use color uh, in in their own cultural beliefs and religious beliefs. Uh, white we know as the color of purity and light and innocence. It's kind of an, um, an unattainable color. Uh, we say that, that pure white, like the purest white is unable to be mixed or even unable to be created as a pigment, which is the, you know, sort of the foundation of paint or dyes, that sort of thing. So in some ways it's unattainable. The Japanese have six different terms for the color white, reflecting various levels of brightness and energy. And it's important in so many cultures and rituals and cults. It's associated with celestial power. It's an emblem of the divine. It's associated with transfiguration and of course, innocence. I believe I've mentioned that before. We think about Snow White and the story of the loss of innocence. Um, it's used in initiations of uh, rituals for rebirth and virginity, uh, transformations from, you know, into a different uh, time of life. Interestingly, in Asian cultures, in many Asian cultures, it's the color of mourning and death the opposite of what a lot of Western cultures uh, feel uh, about the color of mourning and death. Next slide. Yellow, the color of brilliance and warmth and abundance. It's the color of harvest, the color of gold. In India, it's the happy yellow color um, produced uh, with turmeric, which is that sort of golden uh, bright yellow. Evidently, uh, sometimes turmeric is rubbed on skin. And if you touch someone whose skin has been uh, tinted with turmeric, that's a symbol of luck and prosperity and health. In China, uh, yellow is the supreme color. It's the color of the emperor. It belongs to the emperor. It symbolizes glory and progress and happiness. Red, which is next slide, Julia. Oops, black. Oh my goodness. I, yes, red. Red is often produced with iron oxide, which is one of the most widely used pigments. It's easily available. When you think even about cave paintings, um, you don't see blue, you don't see green, you see a lot of red and brown because it was so easily mined and easily uh, dealt with. Um, it's, uh, it, it's fidelity. It's the symbol of blood, hunt, war, passion, love, status, power, um, and often given to religious leaders as vestments. So it really has a wide range of, it's, it's a brilliant color. And I think it invokes a lot of, um, you know, uh, 
emotional responses. Next slide. Blue almost universally is a, a positive uh, color, uh, representing calm, cool, the sea, the sky, sometimes sadness. Uh, it's one of the rarest pigments, so you don't see it in ancient um, uh, depictions of, of art. Um, and it doesn't appear in cave paintings. Uh, interestingly, in Celtic cultures and in some Germanic colors, uh, it was the color of the enemy. Uh, if you remember Braveheart and Mel Gibson putting blue uh, paint on his face, that was sometimes used to frighten the enemy who considered that the color uh, or frighten their the, uh, the warriors used it to frighten their uh, enemies. Um, in Syrian culture, blue represents a vindictive or a devious person. They call they might call someone uh, a blue bone, a blue bone, or a blue enemy, a bitter adversary. Next slide. And green, the natural world, freshness, growth, hope, renewal, but also money in our culture, evil, envy. Green pigment is even rarer than blue pigment. Um, and I'm talking about in, in more ancient cultures. Now, of course, everything is, is so available to us, not only in natural pigments, but in, in manufactured you know, chemical pigments. Um, in the Congo, green is a symbol of nourishment and virility. In Ghana, green signifies newness, fertility, and vitality. So I think we can, we can understand that uh, you know, easily. Um, Julia, if we can go back to you know full full screen and end the end the show, I just want to say a couple of comments here. Um, thanks to Kager Hardinger who um, helped me with photographs this week, uh, to David Braun, who, uh, some of the photographs of the church, those beautiful drone photographs, which I just have to buy a drone. This is just too much fun. Uh, those are, are beautiful things. And I wanna, uh, I wanna thank Kay. Well, I, I sort of wanna thank her. She told me about an app with a color game where you are asked to determine hue, saturation, and value to, to play a game. Let me show you this. So the way that this works is that you get a bunch of colors, you're asked to drag them down uh, to fill in the blanks to produce a smooth transition from one to the next. So I'm gonna just do this now and then show you the result because I know the answer to this one. So that's the winner there. Um, and it's called Blendoku, like Sudoku, except with the word blend in it. And it's a free app. Uh, this one's pretty easy, but there are some very challenging um, levels of this that really develop your eye and it's way more fun than mixing paint and it's a lot cleaner as well. But I think you can learn a lot from this now, especially with some vocabulary uh, to help you make these decisions. So uh, I hope you learned a little bit about the world of color and uh, it's, a, it's a big world. If you're an art major, you might take two years of color theory where you really dig in and figure out just exactly how colors work for each other, against each other. And um, again, I think one of the biggest lessons about color is to try to break away from things that are just your favorites to colors that are the most effective and will work for whatever situation you, you might encounter. I'll take any questions that you might have. Thank you. I have a suggestion first. There's a raise hand button that you can find below your screen and that might help us to find you. And I have a couple of questions on chat. Maybe we can start with those. Ooh, where are those? Oh, I see. I can read them. Well, yeah, Kate, we Kate O'Connell asks, is value sometimes referred to as shade? Yes, value, uh, if you look, uh, again, if you can visualize a, a paint chip strip at Lowe's, um, uh, those are called tints and shades. 
So tints are colors that are mixed with white and shades are colors that are mixed with black. Um, so, but you can see already that it can get really confusing. It's, it's sure, uh, right. complex. Shades though, refer to uh, colors that are mixed down with black. The, I'm a crossword puzzle user and, and the uh, last week there was just a wrong answer. Uh, it said something about a shade and the answer was hue. And I thought, no, no, it's not hue. It's tints and shades and black and white and light and dark uh, anyway. And then the other question, let's see, that, that's the only question I that's see. That's the name of the book that Anne gave you. Pam Skinner wants to know the name of the book that Anne found uh, for you. Hang on. <laughs> In the meantime, oh, uh, and we have, we'll, we'll have a raised hand pretty soon when he gets back from Daniel Finkel. Steve. Uh, oh, it's called Color Index. And let me just flip through this. Look at this. Ooh. This is like this is my world. I can get lost in this. Love it. Love and so it. every color has a huge chapter, and then they give examples of kind of mixing that color with here in here with purple and all the different combinations. And interestingly, there are Pantone codes with these, oh. and also uh, codes that help you mix colors on the computer, which is a whole different system of numbers and values. Yeah. Very cool. It's a big world. We have some hands raised. Daniel Finkel oh. first. Yeah. Um, I, my question relates to the color trends. And I'm just wondering, are there certain colors that maybe are more, I'll use the word timeless, that aren't trendy, maybe like the primary and secondary colors, or do all colors sort of come and go in favor? I think all colors kind of come and go. I mean, that's what fashion is about. Things have to change so more, more can be sold. Um, I, I don't have a great answer to that because, because color, I mean, I think, Dan, maybe you're talking in terms of like retail, you know, things you can buy, which is what Pantone is really all about. They're, they're uh, uh, consulting services. Um, but I think colors are kind of timeless. I mean, over the, over the, over the ages though, yeah, different, different trends. Let, let me, I, I don't have a great answer to that question. Can I give you an example of like, yeah. um, you, you walk into a kitchen and there's an avocado green refrigerator and you're like, oh, this kitchen is from the sixties. Exactly. Are, are there certain colors where you can't say, oh, this room you know, from a design perspective, this was yeah. done in this decade. Yeah, um, as far as the 60s go, if you were, you know, back in the 60s, the environmental mu movement was taking off and everything was kind of about earth tones. And I'll bet Pantone had something to do, <laughs> do with all of that, but all of those harvest gold, avocado, um, you know, my mother's kitchen probably looked exactly like your mother's kitchen with those kinds of things. And it reflects the culture. Um, if you remember um, the 80s, the 80s were all about bright, happy, and in, in many cases, pastel colors that were real, you know, forward thinking, positive. It was, it was a very wealthy time. It was a time of an abundance and uh, not a lot of war going on. I think it was a very positive, upbeat time. But then again, that's the world of retail culture and sort of pop culture. Um, I mean, I, I don't think the world of art trends in those ways. How about uh, uh, David Braun or the Braun video? Yeah, yeah. I had to unmute myself. Uh, Steve, this took me way back to my freshman year at Michigan and the uh, elective course on introduction to psychology. And one of the lectures in there was all about color. And of course, in that particular year, color TV was beginning to take off. Yeah. And I don't know if everybody knows it, but the screen you're looking, probably looking at, uh, all those colors are actually composed of only three colors, red, green, and blue. 
And one of the uh, demonstrations they did in that course was relating to complementary colors. And they showed us a picture. Um, they used two projectors that were very closely focused together. And one projector had a photograph that was taken with one color. And the other projector had a photograph that was taken with the opposite color, with the complementary color. And then the, uh, the, the filters were uh, were used to uh, project it. And they showed us the one and then they showed us the other and then they showed us the two together and you had the entire rainbow. And that was with only two colors. So apparently this, you know, the, the, the theory behind color and how it reacts on the brain is in the realm of psychology. Well, okay, without getting too uh, deep into the trenches here, Everything that I told you today is about pigment and paint and printing techniques and art techniques. The whole world of light is complete, it's a completely different world. The three primary colors in light are red, blue, and green. I don't know if you've ever heard of someone throwing around the term RGB. Yep. Uh, <laughs> and that's how uh, computer uh, uh, screens are dealt with, that's how um, uh, images are produced on televisions. And for example, um, if you, and Dan Finkel, the world of stage lighting, uh, to get a yellow light on a stage, you mix a red light with a green light. Well, if you did that with paint, red and green are opposite colors on the color wheel, and you'd get a grayish brown mud color. Mm -hmm. So so it's just like a completely different world, the world of color light, versus the world of color as far as pigment and ink and yeah. paint. Yeah, and if you think about it also, uh, paint uh, derives the color from what it gives back. If you shine oh, white light it, on it, it gives back that particular set of colors. Whereas yeah. when you're generating the light with a, an LED or uh, any other particular uh, chemistry, then you're getting the generation of the light rather than the reflection of it. Um, uh, Steve, this is absolutely fantastic. I think uh, we're going to have one more question, sure. and um, and I think uh, I'll, I'll say thank you after we discuss with somebody from the Nichols household has a question. Steve, can can all of you hear me, Sarah? Yes, I, I, I just want to. A historian that I am, I want to point out I've learned a lot from my good friend, Steve, and I've also enjoyed um, witnessing the perpetuation of a centuries old debate in Western art. When Steve said color um, is, of course, the most, or at least for him, and he guessed for many of us, the most important dynamic in representation. Um, already in the 16th century, there was this debate called the colorist, colorists first versus disegno, meaning Venice, Titian, Florence, line, drawing. Stand in the Toledo Museum of Art, great gallery, and you'll see the debate raging between the Rubenists, color, uh, and the Poussinists, Poussin, line, in the 19th century, mm -hmm. Ang, I-N-G-R-E-S, versus Delacroix. And now we have history take with Steve Whipfley in the early 21st century taking a stance for color. Postscript, when next anyone looks at a uh, agony in the garden or the last supper, you will notice that Judas in Western European art is always in yellow, which oh. was the color of sin. Thank you, Sarah. Steve, thank Interesting. you. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. I, I love this topic, and I, I'm just eager to learn more. I'm a quilter, and I don't know enough about color, except I know, you know, that anyway, I've learned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, and everybody. everybody, we let's just do a little round of applause as we can. Thank you, Steve. And remember to send my me game. Yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna download that. It's um, really and fun. Remember, send me your suggestions or offer to to share something. We, you know, you don't have to. I mean, I know Steve's a hard act to follow, but 
we have many, many things to share in just this group of people whose faces I'm looking at. So uh, nominate somebody else if, if you don't think they have the courage to speak up and I will talk to them. So thank you everybody. Thanks. Have a wonderful day. Adios.